Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Thank you for joining us this afternoon in our discussion about applying to schools and programs of public health. This is the third of a series of webinars with us this week celebrating National Public Health Week. My name is Tracy Stewart. I'm the Senior Director of Educational Pathways and Undergraduate Education, and I'm excited to be joined today by two excellent panelists. Um, I, we've got Yvonne Foise, the Executive Director of Admissions and Recruitment at Emory University Rollins School of Public Health, and Amanda Stofeski, Assistant Director of Admissions and Recruitment at the Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine and MPH program. I'm going to turn over the webinar to them. Great, Morgan, if we can have the next slide, we'll show everyone what we will be discussing here today. So trying to break it into some big categories, we'll do a general background about ASPPH, what we're offering both to you as a prospective applicant into graduate public health education, um, but also beyond that. We'll provide some resources to help you find your best fit because there are so many wonderful programs out there. And then we'll dive into the application requirements at a high level in a general application timeline. I did wanna add that throughout our presentation, while we are chatting, feel free to put any questions that you might have in the Q&A function. You'll find that on your toolbar next to the chat box that you might be very familiar with. Um, we will be able to have some time at the end to discuss any questions that come up throughout the presentation. So ASPPH has three brand identities to help students um, as they're on a pathway to a career in public health. Um, so the first that you might be familiar with is this is public health. This is built on awareness and highlighting how public health is so interdisciplinary, how it really touches every industry that there is, and highlighting how you can work in public health, um, not just in a silo, but as a part of a larger community. Following that is SOFIS, which is our centralized application service for public health programs. Um, many CIF accredited MPH programs will use SOFIS not only for their MPH programs, but also different graduate level programs, as well as doctoral degrees. Um, this is a wonderful service that we will dive into a little bit deeper in this presentation um, that is designed for efficiency and really to take some of the workload of applying and entering grad school off of the students and make it a um, easier process for you to start your career in public health. And then last but not least is public health jobs. Um, this is a career service tool that is available to all for free. And it's designed to help connect um, students and alum in public health with a with a job that, um, so connecting students and employers together, um, offering not only local, but international positions. Um, and we have over 2000 um, current positions currently listed on public health jobs, but we'll dive in a little bit more going forward. So education levels and career opportunities. When you are looking at the slide, it really shows how you can specifically study public health um, in a formal educational setting. Today, we're going to focus mostly on the master's and doctoral programs, um, really highlighting the MPH, DRPH, and PhD programs. So what do you do with a public health degree? Um, so this slide is wonderful because it breaks down the top employers for public health graduates based off of education attainment. So as you can see, healthcare organizations is overall the largest employer of public health graduates. But when you step back and you decide to look at it by education attainment, so looking at the different degree levels, you can see that that shifts. So for doctoral students, academic institutions are the largest employer, whereas those that earn their bachelor's in public health, um, their largest employer is for-profit organizations. So 
It might be helpful as you're starting your journey into public health education or you're considering your next step that you think of where you want to end up and maybe let some of this research help dictate your next steps um, and considerations for um, what you want to do next and how um, your public health education can help you reach your goals. So jumping back to that wonderful free resource, public health jobs. Um, as I mentioned, over 2,000 jobs currently posted across over 1,300 employers, meaning many organizations are listing more than one available position. And as you can see, candidates are represented by over 200 countries. And again, going back to ASPPH's uh, general goal of supplying these different pathways throughout your journey of public health. Um, this is one way that we will continue to support you on your journey and highlighting that public health really is all encompassing of the workforce. So whether you want to go into environmental health or epidemiology or child and maternal health, health policy, you'll find different opportunities based off of your specific interests that you can then filter to better meet your needs. So next we're going to share a little bit more about the resources available to you to find your best fit. All right, well, thank you so much, Amanda. So there are so many areas of study within public health for students to consider as you're thinking about resources that are available. And um, some areas of study you've likely heard a lot about, like epidemiology, particularly as it related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and of course, epidemiology is known as the cornerstone of public health in terms of its scientific approach to looking at the spread of diseases. Um, community health and behavioral and social science oftentimes go together alongside health promotion and communication. And these areas of studies are actually aiming um, to change behavior in communities. One example that I always like to give is that years ago, um, none of us wore seatbelts. Even though um, my parents were you know, very great parents and very nurturing and, and took all the necessary precautions, um, I did not wear a seatbelt as a child growing up. And um, now as a mom, it's hard to imagine that um, kids would get into a car without a seatbelt or even that I would get into a car without a seatbelt. But what happened was um, there were some studies done looking at uh, the number of lives lost in car accidents. And somebody, likely a behavioral and social science person within public health said, wait a minute, we can launch a campaign to change behavior. And this goes along with health promotion and communication. So all of a sudden we saw signs going up on highways and freeways across the country. And there was a real concerted effort to get into communities and explain the importance of wearing seatbelts. Um, and so those areas of study typically go together and oftentimes are really aimed at changing behavior. I always like to say that if you're a doer within public health and you want to be in community and understand how communities exist and how we can partner together with communities in order to um, enable change, then this might be a great area of study for you. Maternal and child health is another area of study that is common within schools of programs of public health. And uh, this really studies some of the outcomes of maternity and also um, children's health. Uh, sadly, in the United States, and in particular in the Southeast United States, we actually have one of the highest maternal mortality rates, even in comparison with other um, uh, developed countries, as it were. And so looking at some of the disparities, some of the resources, some of the um, social determinants of health, that go into um, how these outcomes are impacting communities as an area of study as well. Um, global health is something that many students are interested in. So making an impact globally, understanding how to build programs, how to exhibit cultural humility, and how to scale up those programs in a global context. 
Um, health policy and management is also another popular selection for our students. And in health policy and management, we're looking at some of the policies and even laws that impact um, healthcare in the United States. And this can range from topics such as Obamacare, which we now know as Obamacare, um, but also policies around maternal and child health and around what should be covered by uh, large managed care organizations. Um, those are all interesting topics that you as a student can begin to explore. Um, and one of the pieces of advice that I typically um, offer to folks looking to come into public health is that there really is no wrong choice. These are all interdisciplinary. They don't exist in a silo. And lots of times you'll see these that crosses over. Um, and, and the other tip that I can offer is think about what would be your ideal typical work setting. Um, if you, for example, love data and you love to be able to use predictive modeling and um, you love to understand the theory behind math that can inform um, certain statistical outcomes, then, you know, biostats and informatics might be a great match for you. But you know, if you love the environment and you love to be outdoors and you want to understand how it is that our environment impacts human health, um, and maybe you're even interested in a little bit of bench science, then environmental health might be the match for you. But either way, there are ample choices and uh, many areas of public health to explore. It's also not uncommon that students may receive a specialized master of public health in one area, but end up by training uh, working in another area of public health. And again, that just underscores the interdisciplinary nature of the study of public health. One of the resources that can help you as a student is the Academic Program Finder. And this can be found under the ASPPH.org website. And you can search uh, programs by area of study. So say, for example, you wanted to know how many schools are offering a study of behavioral and social science. And um, those uh, schools that offer this program will all uh, populate for you. You can also search by institution. So as an example, say you um, live in Boston and you currently are not interested in relocating. And so you're looking to find a master of public health um, within that geographic location. You can also search by institution. You can also search by keyword or location. So say, for example, um, you're interested in living in a warm climate, you might search um, West Coast, or you might search Southeastern United States or enter a particular state. And so it's a very versatile tool that can help you identify um, programs and schools of public health across the country. Another great resource that um, is offered through um, ASPPH is the uh, This is Public Health Student Ambassador Program. Students are invited um, to join and to apply to be a part of the TIP Student Ambassador Program once they are enrolled master's degree students. And these uh, ambassadors are available to answer any questions that you may have. Sometimes they participate in uh, panels such as this one to offer their experiences in studying public health. And they're really um, a wonderful asset for students that might be looking for a specialized program or that might be interested in hearing about one particular student's path within public health. Another wonderful resource, um, and I love this one in particular because it's so easy and accessible, um, for students are the um, offerings of many graduate fairs um, under the This is Public Health umbrella of um, ASPPH. And these graduate fairs allow both students and schools and programs of public health to come together in sort of little seminar style 
um, presentations and um, to have conversations with prospective students. You'll actually be able to type into the chat specific areas of interest and questions that you have. And they're purposefully designed to be small so that we can have a little bit more of a personalized approach to having conversations with students. So as you are beginning to explore the many choices that you will have in terms of your graduate school education for a master's in public health, this is a wonderful resource for you. It does not cost anything um, for the student to join. And um, for all of us that represent schools and programs of public health, it's a pleasure to meet students within this forum, particularly again if you're just starting your search and looking to understand, for example, what are the similarities or differences in the application process between schools and programs of public health, or you're even looking to narrow um, your choices for where you might apply. Um, because they are virtual, they're accessible, and um, oftentimes are offered uh, during um, the academic year and during times when we know students are available to join us. So um, be sure to look out for um, the series of mini graduate fairs that uh, will take place this academic year. These fairs are offered, um, as you can see, in July, September, November, and January. Um, and uh, TIP virtual fairs are a little bit different than the mini fairs that I just uh, talked about. These fairs often last um, anywhere from two to four hours. And again, prospective students can join um, these career echo fairs. Um, any at any time during the um, open uh, window of when a school might join. So as an example, as this mentioned, I represent the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. We actually do participate in each one of the months that are offered for TIP virtual fairs. And these are kind of more large um, open fairs. So I might have my virtual booth open from 11 to 2 p.m. And I would have my camera on and I, essentially I'm just available to have small conversations and to answer students one on one. So this is a great um, vehicle by which you can begin to know about programs and interact with um, representatives from schools. Oftentimes I'm joined by graduate assistants that volunteer in our office and are also available to answer questions. And for you as a student, as I mentioned, it is free for you to join. And another great way to begin to know which schools and programs of public health might be a great match and fit uh, for your goals. And finally, we also have TIP graduate school fairs that are hosted in person. Um, many times you will see a TIP graduate school fair hosted in conjunction with a large meeting. As an example, the American Public Health Association hosts a meeting every year, and there is typically a tip fair that follows that meeting. So last year in um, late October, early November, the um, large meeting was hosted in Boston and the tip graduate school fair was um, hosted at BU's medical school. And so this is an opportunity for, again, you to visit different booths. Um, typically, you'll see schools represented by one of us, um, and we can always help answer those questions. Um, and it's a nice um, combination to be able to offer both virtual and in-person opportunities for students. And in this way, we really can um, make sure that we're meeting students where they are. And that might be geographically in your hometown, or it might be online because you're unable to travel where we will be hosting a graduate school fair. Um, but these again, provide just an excellent opportunity for our students to connect with various programs and schools of public health, all in one easy and convenient setting. The thing that I like most about um, the graduate uh, in-person fairs is that one, you also get some swag. We usually have um, some things that we give away as, um, as part of those opportunities. 
And two, it is always such a delight to meet students in person, um, particularly when it comes full circle. Inevitably, I will meet some students somewhere in the United States and then actually have the opportunity to meet them again on our campus or to read their application for admission. And um, for all of us that are committed to the field of public health and, and looking to identify um, the next leaders uh, within this profession, it's always delightful to be able to meet um, with students in person when that is possible. Now, we know um, that uh, many of us are connected to social media and you will also find a representation for This Is Public Health on both Facebook and Instagram. And so that is also a valuable resource. As you're scrolling, you can check out This Is Public Health and look at some of the upcoming events and, and some of the things that are happening um, in and around the country as well as virtually. So make sure that you follow This Is Public Health both on Facebook Facebook and Instagram. And some additional um, resources that you might find helpful um, really center around how to finance your degree. We know that financing graduate education is top of mind for all students who apply. And um, there are so many resources that are available um, and provided through ASPPH. Um, at the Rollins School of Public Health, we actually share um, this very page with our students quite often as a resource where they can consult and understand different um, scholarships that are available. And some of these are offered with certain criteria and guidelines in mind. So for example, you see citizenship requirement. Many of our international students are seeking funding and, and looking for available resources that don't require that a student to be a permanent resident or American citizen. Um, some of the um, scholarships being offered are targeted at uh, students who may have demonstrated financial need. And so make sure that as part of your consideration in terms of which school will be the best match for you as a student and person and professional in public health, that you are also considering finances and that financial match and understanding the resources that are available to you to help you fund your graduate education in public health. There are application requirements, of course, <laughs> as part of um, any uh, school and program of public health. And so I'm going to turn that um, part of the presentation over to my co-presenter, Amanda. Thank you, Ivan. Um, so going back to what we spoke about at the very beginning of this presentation, ASPPH offering these three student pathways, Ivan just covered in um, great detail, thank you, the uh, public health jobs that we have available, as well as the resource that uh, this is public health, which we were referring to as TIFF, you'll hear quite often as you begin um, your graduate education journey, um, what those resources look like in a little bit more depth. So at this point, we're going to transition into that final piece, which is SOFIS. So SOFIS, once again, is very similar to the common application. And this was designed with you, prospective students, in mind. We want to make the, the challenge that it is to apply for graduate school, because it is. It, it costs um, your time. It's, of course, a financial investment. And also, there is a, a mental and emotional part that goes into deciding where you want to attend. And so with that, we try to take as much of that lift off of you as possible. And so this is what the application center looks like. This would be your homepage after creating an account with SOFIS. This personal information box that you'll see first, that's going to be very similar to any other application that you would fill out, whether it be for an academic institution, an internship, volunteer, this is gathering all your demographic information, um, your emergency contacts, that sort of stuff. What's nice is that's not going to change between program to program. So we are able to, using the SOFA system, duplicate that for every program that you're applying to. 
Next is your academic history. So through SOFIS, you are required to submit official transcripts from any institution which you have attempted, keyword, attempted um, education credits for. So if you went to your local state school for your entire academic career, you'll have one transcript to send in. However, if you took a summer chem class or you completed your calculus course at the local community college, um, that will need its own transcript sent in. Again, what's nice is you're only doing this once. You're sending one official copy into the SOFA system. They complete a verification process. And then that ensures when you're applying to multiple programs, um, we kind of get that check mark that somebody verified this information and it avoids you having to connect with different offices, making sure that you're supplying the right requirements because it's all this one-stop shop. Your supporting information is going to be the places that um, you get to supply a little bit more about yourself and your personality. This will include your letters of recommendation. The SOFA system requires a minimum of three and a maximum of five. We'll go into a little bit more detail, some recommendations for who should write your letter soon. Um, but what else lives here would be your resume, um, any sort of additional statements. There is an optional writing sample that you are able to submit. Um, and this is where if a student ever has a concern about their application, they had a poor academic term um, due to any reason, whether that be a loss in the family, an illness, um, I always recommend submitting an addendum, which is just a short written statement that is apart from your personal statement that explains that situation. And um, it's a great way to acknowledge that you know that this could potentially be viewed as a deficiency at your application overall as a whole. Um, and a lot of admissions committees just like to see that you're taking the opportunity to explain that. Um, really, that's all it is. It's a great way for you to step over that barrier for yourself rather than leaving the admissions committees with any pondering questions about that situation. And finally, the program materials, as you select schools that you want to apply to, each school will have a few additional personal questions tied to that program itself. So it might be a series of multiple choice questions or short answers. Um, and you'll also be able to submit um, personalized personal statements um, or statements of intent for each school, individualizing it based off of that school strengths, what you like about it, um, and being sure that you address each school's personal statement or letter of intent prompt if one is provided. So probably one of the most questions that we get in all of those events that Yvonne mentioned that we host throughout the fall and spring are how you can submit your best application. So I always like to say, take a step back, think about where you want to go. What is your personal end goal? We talked about where public health grads end up, what industry, what sector. So start there and then think forward. Use kind of a funnel strategy here. Think about what you are hoping to do as your long-term goals and then start looking for programs. It's easier to align yourself and be excited and being able to make those personal statements, make some of those smaller supplemental pieces more meaningful and more impactful if you're actually excited about the school because you know it's going to supply you with the education and the resources and tools you need to reach your long-term goal. We take a holistic review of all applications, meaning that every piece 
of material that you submit through your SOFIS application is considered by every program that you're applied to. Um, each program will have their own requirements um, as far as admission, of course. So it is important to, while you're looking at which programs to apply to, see if your prior experience aligns. Make sure that there aren't um, certain re prerequisite requirements in order to be accepted into a certain delivery format. If there's an executive NPH or doctoral program, um, making sure that you fulfill all of those requirements before applying. Um, but going back to it, it, it is holistic. This is where you really get to highlight who you are and what you want to do. And I can tell you being on this side of um, the admissions process now, and also an alum of um, Dartmouth MPH program. So I've been in the shoes of an applicant not all that long ago. Um, it is hard to sit down and highlight why not only this program is a good fit for you, but I think more importantly, highlight what you can do for the school. Highlight how you will be an engaged student, how you want to change public health, what you want to do both short-term and long-term. I know our admissions committees at Dartmouth love to see people thinking um, not only just 20 years out, but where do you hope to be in two years after completing an MPH degree program? And I think having that awareness helps guide some of these smaller um, pieces of the application process. So general application requirements that we touched on that first kind of portal homepage slide. Um, again, all official transcripts. The one area that this gets a little gray, I will say is if you did a study abroad program. So I always recommend just double checking. Um, if you did a study abroad program through your home institution, um, meaning where you are completing your undergraduate degree, Usually you won't have to get um, an additional transcript for that, but that is always my one recommendation. Double check that early. For standardized test scores, most programs will have um, their standardized test um, listed on their website, whether they are a requirement needed to be reviewed for admission, um, but most MPH programs are making them optional or they are not requiring them and or not considering them if they are submitted. So it's always a great idea. I will say prior to the pandemic, um, GRE scores were something that were very commonly required. Um, so definitely just take a time. This is the slide where we really highlight how each program operates differently in their admissions review process, um, which goes into the letter of recommendation requirement. I know at Dartmouth, we only require two letters of rec, but SOFIS, the system itself requires three. So we're always happy to have that conversation to provide resources on what to do in that situation. We always recommend trying to get three letters of recommendation from people who know you as a student and as a person. I would say, when you take a step back and look at who you might consider to write this letter on your behalf, think about those who know you well and that you wouldn't have to necessarily supply a resume to in order for them to write this letter. We care more about the quality and the depth of this recommendation than the title of the person who's writing it. It will go a lot further to the application reviewer or faculty member if the, the letter has um, very genuine and sincere things to say rather than um, something more standardized. Moving into the personal statement, I echo the same sentiment. Um, I want to highlight again, most programs will have their own um, prompt provided to you, whether that be on their actual um, program page, which you would find in SOFIS after selecting the school and your program of interest. Um, also on their website, this is one area where it's, um, it's easy to write a good statement of purpose or personal statement if you are genuinely excited about the program. 
And so again, making sure the places that you're applying to really fulfill the needs that you're asking for and that thinking about once you graduate from that program, do you feel that you would be immediately supplied with the tools that you need to continue forward um, towards your own personal and professional goals? A resume is required for all applications. Um, there's also an additional experience section where you can break into a little bit more detail each of those experiences, whether they be volunteer or paid or internship. Um, we have it as optional at our institution, whether or not you complete that additional experiences page, but it is a wonderful opportunity for you to expand on the work that you've done. That is hard to convey in a, the style of a resume, which is really meant to be a high overview of the work you've been doing. And finally, some programs might have additional requirements. Um, there might be a required writing statement. There might be um, additional uh, pieces that they're looking for you to supply. Again, a lot of programs might do short answers about what your like long-term and short-term goals are. Um, so just be mindful, give yourself enough time to think about these very meaningfully and reflect on them because it, it might help really shape um, what schools you do and do not apply to. Yvonne, would you mind taking over a little bit more about the international applicant requirements? I am happy to do so. And can you, okay, there it is. I was looking for my video, but um, I see that it has now popped up. We know and recognize that international students um, are an important part of the dialogue and educational process in public health. In so many ways, you bring um, such a, un a unique perspective um, to our schools and programs, and we welcome your application for admission. There are some additional requirements uh, for international students, and these, of course, can vary by school. One of the requirements that is generally required um, for schools and programs of public health is the WES evaluation. WES is an acronym which stands for the World Education Services. And essentially what they do is verify the credentials from the academic credentials from our student applicants. So as you can imagine, um, we receive applications for admission from all around the world, truly. And there is no way for us to understand um, and to be able to effectively um, comprehend each and every different academic curriculum that exists. And so this web service helps to translate those documents, first of all, to English um, in a language that we can comprehend and understand, but also to make sure to provide any kind of commentary around a class that might be offered in a different country and how that might match up to a class that we offer here in the United States. So as an example, sometimes um, science courses are referred to very differently um, and, it, and using different words than what we would typically use in the American educational system. Thus, it's imperative that you have your transcript submitted um, to our schools through using the WES evaluation um, system. In addition to that, while many schools and programs of public health are now not requiring standardized um, uh, test scores, this can vary by institution. And so I do encourage you to um, make sure to visit the different websites of the schools that you're applying to, to have a firm understanding of each school's requirements. Most schools will still require international students to provide um, proof of English language proficiency. And you can do so in one um, of two ways, through TOEFL or IELTS. And those are um, exams that our students take that, able, that allow us to document that you have a good command of the English language and the ability to earn a graduate degree um, in the English language. 
Uh, there are some schools that also offer Duolingo as a way to meet this requirement. And again, you'll want to um, make sure that you understand individual requirements of schools. I will note that most of these exams are now available online. And so it is the case that several years ago, um, students actually had to go into a testing uh, center in order to take the TOEFL. It's now widely available online. And many schools also will provide a waiver if you've been enrolled in an undergraduate degree program in the United States, or if you reside in a country that has English as an official language. Again, this can vary by school. Just a note on this, that as part of the um, visa uh, uh, process for international students, if you are applying under um, an F-1 visa to be a student at one of our institutions, it's actually a Department of Homeland Security requirement that we confirm that you have a good command of the English language. And so please know that um, not only is this a requirement for schools, because we want to make sure that you um, can benefit from our program and that you will be immersed in the full life of the school, um, but we also need to document and have proof um, that you have a good command of the English language. Like all other applicants for admission, you will submit letters of recommendation, which Amanda um, has already spoken about, the statement of purpose and resume. And international students, again, as part of the requirements under the Department of Homeland Security, when you request an I-20, which is the document needed in order to secure a visa, you will need to provide documentation that essentially attest that you have enough funds to live in the United States and to pay tuition for one academic year. Universally, among schools and programs of public health, we call that the total cost of attendance. So the total cost of attendance includes tuition, but it also includes an average cost to live in that city that includes things like food and housing. And the US government requires that we actually receive something from a bank that says, um, you know, Miss so and so has um, sufficient funds, and this is a bank account with this balance on it that is proof that this person has enough money to support themselves in the United States for one year. Without that financial document, you will not be able to receive the I-20, which is the document that you need in order to secure a visa. And so as you are planning for your studies in the United States, please know that these are the requirements that um, are needed in order to ensure a successful application and transition to our school. And back to Amanda with your statement of purpose. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, lots of great information there. So back to writing your statement of purpose, we've talked about this quite a bit throughout the webinar today, but your statement of purpose, when you look at it, is really the one place your personality can truly shine through. You might have the best resume, a very successful academic history, but the statement of purpose is where you get to tell the programs and specifically the person reading your application who you are and what led you on this journey to applying to this particular school. And so that's why I really wanted to highlight the importance of addressing a prompt that a program gives you um, specifically and making sure that you are addressed, not only addressing that, but making sure that it's different and personalized um, for each program. Again, this is easier to do the more excited you are about each program and finding that fit is really the first step. Again, I would take the funnel approach, think big. Why do you want to go into public health? Did you have a personal experience? Um, was it a situation like the pandemic, which really highlighted not only um, what public health is, but the ongoing need um, for resources and funds and professionals in this space? 
think about what you want to do. Maybe the job that you're thinking of doesn't immediately appear to be public health based, but could it be? As we've mentioned, so much touches public health. Um, you really can't go into any field or industry without having a public health lens. And so it doesn't necessarily mean pulling you out of uh, an industry that you thought you would end up in. Maybe you're just doing it in a different capacity um, in a way that you can have maybe a larger impact. And then finally, why the school? The person that is sitting down to read your application, um, keep in mind, you're probably likely not the first application they've ever read. So why this school is so important? Why did you decide to take the time to apply to this program? And that is really a key part of the statement of purpose. Why the school and why this program are almost always part of the specific prompt if provided. So do a little bit of research, figure out what was it that initially attracted you to the program? Was it the name? Was it the location? Did you have a friend or family member that went to the larger institution at the undergraduate level and had a great community experience? You can mention that. This is again, where you get to be you. And I, I think that gets lost sometimes in these statements because everyone's so focused on providing and writing the best statement to make themselves um, look like such a strong candidate. But when you think about it, public health is such a humanitarian um, field. We're all people just trying to help other people. And don't lose that person aspect. Don't lose who you are in the process of trying to highlight your strengths, except that um, some things are tough. Maybe what led you on a path to public health was not um, a positive experience. And you're taking that and you're choosing to help others from experiencing that. Or maybe you did. Maybe you had someone that was your advocate during a difficult situation and you want to go on and uh, continue the work that they offered to you and that support. Whatever your reason, your purpose, that's what you should be putting in your personal statement or your statement of purpose. That's what's going to um, that's going what's going to attract the person reading your story to say this person knows what they want. They very are clearly motivated, um, and I, I hope that they will come to our program. And so I want to be respectful of time for Q&A. So we will just give a high level overview of the application timeline. So again, very high level. Um, Mid-August is when the SOFIS application system will open. So if you logged on to SOFIS right now, there are still some programs that are accepting applications for likely their summer, fall, potentially winter of 2023 start. But the new application system or cycle will open up on um, August 18th, usually around there, at least um, mid-August. And so that's when every program is still accepting applications, really for the first time that season. Then through late fall, early winter, there are wonderful um, recruitment activities going on, different ways to engage with admissions teams to learn more about what it means to be a student at these different programs. During that early mid-August start, you could go in and complete all of those pieces that will be duplicated for each program. So think your personal information and background, your academic history, you could start to collect your letters of recommendation and then spend the fall months deciding where you want to apply because those program specific questions and requirements are a much lighter lift. April 15th is this universal deadline that uh, significantly affects enrollment and funding. Um, this tends to be the enrollment deadline for most programs. And so with that, it's students selecting where they want to attend. Um, and then most programs then beginning in August, um, some a little sooner, some a little bit later, it's again, all program specific. So there's one thing that I hope you take away from this. 
first, congratulations on taking this first step towards your future in public health, or for those that might have been working in public health, that next step. And give yourself some grace, take a step back, review everything that we spoke of. There are some wonderful resources out there um, and many links that I know were shared in the chat throughout the presentation, um, but really try to identify what your goals are and what program is best aligned with helping you get there. So I'll pass it off for some Q&A now. Great, thank you so much. That was fantastic. So much good information. Um, we have a bunch of questions in limited time, so we'll try to go quickly, but I know that we're not gonna get to all of these. Um, there's a few questions about um, having worked for a few years before attending. And so um, one is, can you advise about, should your recommendations still be academic or supervisors or what mix? Um, I think that's the first one I want to take. Or I can take that one. Um, we uh, and um, our faculty that um, oftentimes are reviewing applications with us value uh, work experience as part of the overall preparation. If you are currently employed full time, then a letter of recommendation from a professional colleague or a supervisor that can speak to your sort of habits as an employee, perhaps your consistency, um, your uh, general sense of responsibility, that would be a great selection as a letter of recommendation. Um, we would still like to see one letter of recommendation from an academic source as well. Great. I love this question. Um, if you're still figuring out, this webinar is very interesting, but you're still figuring out if public health is the right fit for you. Could you have any resources or ideas of how to get involved and explore that a little bit more? Oh, I'll jump in. So I would say first, um, maybe what I would recommend first is actually going to public health jobs and reviewing what's listed there. See what we are what we are using at ASPPH to connect students and alum with different um, career pathways. Um, I think you'll see quite a broad range. So as you're thinking about that, um, I think it's not necessarily if public health is right for you, but um, like what you can do with public health. Yvonne, do you want to add? Well, no. I think that those are great suggestions and and you might too want to hone in on the difference between public health and clinical health. Um, obviously, they are connected and there is some overlap, but in daily practice, it is really different. And so that might also help to clarify. Great. I actually want to plug our webinar tomorrow is actually called Experience Public Health. And there's four organizations that you can get involved with, uh, with to explore um, opportunities. So you might want to check that out as well. Um, are there GPA cutoffs for grad school? We do not have GPA cutoffs. Again, um, I every program that I know is holistic review. So um, each program obviously will have their own um, review process, but no GPA cutoffs that I know of. Same, and I, I will just add, we know that the past few years have presented some very unique challenges for students. Please know that your application is reviewed by real humans who yeah. understand um, some of the challenges and, and who um, also experience challenges in, in their own life. And so um, if you're feeling like you would like some advice on your academic preparation, I know that any school is happy to kind of review things with you and offer you mm -hmm. some um, consideration and help. Um, I know there's a lot of confusion oftentimes between uh, PhD and DRPH programs. Are either of you able to help guide students in that? A little bit. <laughs> um, so in the, if you're looking to go into research um, and to delve deeper into a particular area of study within public health, then um, a PhD program might be a great match for you. Those students spend 
a huge amount of time developing um, a thesis and researching and publishing. Um, and so uh, PhD students tend to have a very specialized um, interest area within the field of public health. And oftentimes they're even identifying a faculty member that they would like to work with as part of the application process. Um, the DRPH offers a little bit, in, in, in most cases, a little bit more of um, a, a deeper generalist understanding of public health and really prepares students to be public health leaders, but you would actually be practicing public health rather than on the academic side of things or the research side of things. So hopefully that helps. Great. Um, and do you want me to have experience to apply either to the master's or the doctoral level? That is going to be program specific. So as you start to explore programs that you're interested in, um, one of the first things I would always recommend is just looking at the requirements to apply. So application components would be the materials needed in order to have a complete application. Um, admissions requirements would be any prerequisite specific coursework, any sort of specific um, experience level, because that is going to vary from each institution. Can you provide any recommendations on who they might turn to to get um, their CV or statement of purpose reviewed before they submit it? I know it's a nerve wracking thing to submit. It is, and, and please know that um, we take seriously the um, effort and time that students put into their application, and so it will really be read. Um, have a, a trusted colleague read it. I always like to have two sets of eyes, so maybe from somebody that knows me really, really well, um, and then someone who doesn't know me, because you may have left certain things out that um, are maybe such a part of your daily routine that you don't think to mention them. And then it's also, I think, always very useful to have somebody who is um, a very skilled writer take a look at it for that grammar and syntax and, and some of the, the finer details. So um, pick two candidates, one big picture, one little picture, um, and have them uh, sit with it for a moment and, um, and practice your revision process in that way. Um, this is probably the last one. There's a lot of questions about funding, uh, whether they're an international student or not. Um, so can you give any advice about finding funding? Yes. Um, I will say that graduate funding works very different than undergraduate funding. And so if you are a domestic student that um, was able to secure funding as an undergraduate student, please know and be prepared for the fact that graduate funding is quite different. You also want to make sure that you are visiting the funding and tuition websites of each school and program of public health. We do vary in terms of costs and tuition structure and having a base understanding of that is important. For domestic students, complete the FAFSA, regardless of whether or not you completed it as an undergrad, regardless of whether or not you think that you will be identified as a student who has need. Um, at the graduate level, our students are financially independent, so make sure that you complete the FAFSA. For all students, international and domestic, seek outside sources of funding. We are happy to provide you with as much funding as we can as institutions, but we do have budgets um, and limitations. And so being able to combine some grants and scholarships with outside funding can really help you um, to manage your debt and to have um, a funding structure that will work for you. Excellent. Thank you both so much for uh, your time today and all the information you provided. Um, I do want to reiterate, we have two more webinars coming up tomorrow is Experience Public Health and um, Friday it's 40 Under 40, a, a panel about careers in public health. So if you haven't already, feel free to join us. Sign you have uh, questions that didn't get answered today, I'm going to push you probably to send them directly to the schools and programs, but we do have students at ASDPH.org where we can also help you direct, but um, all the program specific questions will go to your schools and programs. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us today and to our great presenters. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.